check. All right, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you uh, for attending this uh, forum today. Uh, I would also like to thank to our uh, participants who choose to join us uh, via Zoom, as well as to those who uh, will view us through the YouTube channel. So uh, good morning and welcome to the Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Forum 2021. I am Nero uh, from Machdi, and together with Ms. Rachel, uh, we will be your host and moderator for today's session. Before we start our forum, let me just read to you our few reminders. So to all our Zoom participants, uh, please use your complete and legal names as your IDs and kindly turn off your audio during the sessions to lessen distractions as well as lagging off connections. A Google feedback form. A uh, link will be sent through Zoom chat box before the session ends. And certificate of attendance will be sent to the registered email once feedback form is submitted. Also, towards the end of the webinar, an open forum will be facilitated. Now, if you have questions, we encourage you to address your queries to our speakers, or you can kindly type them in Zoom chat box or in the comment sections of the live streams in YouTube along with your name, designation, and affiliation. All right, so um, this forum is in line with the celebration of the Maritime and Ar Archipelagic Nation Awareness Month, or MANAMO. Through the Man Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage uh, Division of the National Museum of the Philippines. Under the President Proclamation Number 316, Series 2017, the month of September is declared as the Maritime and Archipelagic Nation Awareness Month, or MANAMO, and this year's theme, Our Seas, Our Livelihood, Our Heritage, Connecting Lives and Nations, aspires to highlight the significance and the value of the marine environment and resources. Now, as the lead agency tasked with the protection and preservation of cultural properties, both sea and land, the National Museum of the Philippines joins in the observance of Manamo. Also, this event is also live in the NMP official YouTube channel. So, to formally open this forum, let us hear from the officer in charge of the Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Division, a maritime archaeologist, and one of the few ceramics experts in the whole of Southeast Asia, Mr. Bobby C. Aurelianeda, sir. Um, thank you very much, Nero. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to attend this forum. So today we have a series of exciting lectures on the use of various scientific equipment in analyzing different materials. Uh, this is conducted by the researchers from the Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Division, the Geology and Paleontology Division, the Fine Arts Division, and the Ethnology Division. So, although the discoveries of archaeological sites and objects grab headlines, material analysis is equally important in interpreting sites that can lead to an accurate description of the past. It can at least answer three questions. First, what are the materials made of? And this concerns the raw materials such as clay, glass, metal, and stone. Second, how was it made? Meaning the process that our ancient ancestors utilized in order to create work of arts and also everyday practical objects. And third, where was it made? This is to determine the source and how it came to be found in a specific location. So later on, equally important is the launching of the 300 years of maritime trade in the Philippines, which highlights seven shipwrecks dated from the 13th, 15th, and 16th century. So these shipwrecks are very instrumental in elucidating our maritime past. So the division has worked very hard for this in the last few months, and I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sir Bob, for that uh, wonderful message. 
Now, uh, let me introduce to you our first speaker for this forum. She is uh, currently the museum researcher of the geology and paleontology division of the National Museum of the Philippines, a licensed geologist from Adamson University. And her works were focused on the geological and paleontological uh, characteristics of the Philippines. Now, without further ado, let's have Ms. Eloisa Magtalas from the geology division. Hello, po. good morning. Po. So first, let me share my PowerPoint. Okay. Good morning, Alet. And first of all, let me say thank you for uh, coming here, attending here this morning. No, I hope na nakapag breakfast na po kayong lahat at ready na po maka, maka, makinig. No? So my discussion is about uh, how to examine a material using XRD analysis. So my presentation... So, sorry. so uh, my presentation is divided into two parts. So what is X-ray diffraction is the first part, and the second part is the XRD analysis uh, using powder method. So first, what is X-ray diffraction? So X-ray diffraction is an analytical method used to determine the crystallographic or the atomic structure of a material using X-ray beams and the principle of Bragg's law. So in X-ray diffraction, we determine or identify the atomic structure or the crystallographic structure of a material. And through this, ma-identify na natin or ma-itindahan na natin the, yung the physical and the chemical um, characteristic of a material. So, uh, so in, in this picture, no, you can see this is the uh, image of the inside image of a XRD machine. So in XRD analysis, you know, a, sample, a sample is placed into the center of an instrument and illuminated with a beam of X-rays. So the X-ray tube is the source. You know, it contains beams of X-rays and the detector is the collector of the diffracted or the scattered X-ray beams. So these two, the X-ray tube, chaka yung detector, they move in synchronized circular motion, and then the uh, the signal coming from the sample is recorded and graphed. No per peaks. So these peaks are observed related to the atomic structure of the sample. So take note in XRD analysis, the sample must be or at least have a crystalline material. So what is the what is a crystalline material? So as, uh, as you may know, no, the, the things that we use in our daily lives is used uh, or rather made up of um, small uh, crystals or minerals. For example, this one, no yung pencil. The lead ng pencil is it's not just a lead, but it is made up of graphite and clay minerals. So the graphite and clay mineral, minerals is consists of atomic structure. So, um, so this crystal is composed a regu regular arrangement of atoms. So meaning yung crystal, crystalline materials has an atoms that are arranged in a regular way. So in So, uh, reminder lang, uh, remember that the X-ray is a high, uh, high energy light wave, no? So, you, when X-ray uh, encounters an atom, its energy is absorbed by electrons. So, this one, when electrons, so when electrons have sufficient energy to dislodge inner shell, uh, this launch the inner shell electrons of the target material, a new X-ray beams produce. 
no but this x-ray beams is the same as the uh, has the same energy uh, as the original so when the atomic uh, atomic planes are exposed to an x-ray beams ito yun. I by the way, can you see nakikita niyo ba yung cursor no so um, the atomic planes are exposed to an X-ray beam. So X-rays are scattered by the regular spaced atoms. So strong amplification of the emitted signal occurs at very specific angles where the scattered waves constructively interfere. Uh, waves constructively interfere. So this effect is called diffraction. So when you say uh, constructively interfere or constructively interference in interference uh, meaning yung diffracted x-rays uh, the diffracted x-rays are parallel to each other no? so uh, when this uh, parallel uh, when the, the diffracted x-rays are aligned to each other uh, they recorded a graph but if the diffracted X-rays are perpendicular or not aligned to each other, so yung graph na ma-record is plot, plot line lang. So this code is a destructive interference. So wala silang ma-record na graph kapag an aligned yung diffracted X-rays. So the occurrence of the constructive interference uh, is best explained in Bragg's law. So the Bragg's law states that when the X-ray is incident onto a crystal surface, its angle of incidence will reflect back with the same angle, uh, same angle of scattering theta. So when the end, when the interplanar spacing of the crystal is equal to the order of reflection of wavelength, a constructive interference will occur. So this lang po nun is that the, that the angle and the distance of the wavelength of the incident x-ray is equals to a must be equal to the scattered x-ray uh, scattered x-ray and this a proceeding po na uh, atomic plane same din dapat yung, uh, yung incident x-ray angle and the scattered x-ray angle must be equal para magkaroon ng parallel uh, parallel x-ray uh, diffracted x-ray beams so the angular positions of the diffracted beams can be used to identify the mineral. So this angular position, ito yung uh, incident, the angle between the incident X-ray and the uh, diffracted X-ray uh, beams. No? So this, two, uh, this angle called 2 theta. So itong 2 theta is the one uh, recorded in the graph. No? And through this, no, through this graph, we can identify the mineral composition of the material. So the application of the XRD, I so uh, widely used so different up uh, as so different industries. No, so they are in pharmaceutical in developing new pharmaceuticals and common strong ginagamit sa classification of rock formation through their mineral components. And it also used in engineering in archaeology and, and archaeology for material testing. So, kaya nga nung sinabi ko nun, uh, the XRD uh, describe or study the atomic structure of a material. And through this, ma-identify ma natin yung physical and chemical characteristic nung material na yun. So, it also used in battery research, in thin film coatings, and in electronics. So next, dun na tayo sa um, next part ng presentation to. will be the XRD analysis using the powder method. So uh, in the National Museum, no, we use the BTX3 bench topper XRD analyzer. So this uh, XRD machines is a portable and invasive. So we can carry it on the field, no? kailangan lang namin ng stable na electric uh, supply. 
So, and the method that we use is the powder method. So, the powder method consists of a finely ground powder prepared by crushing a few tenths of a gram of the test material in a mortar. So, after crushing, you know, after pulverizing the, the sample test, we decisive pa namin. And the grains that pass through a 200 mesh or 400 mesh sieve are placed to metal sample holder. So, it is a uh, metal sample holder. And this uh, approximately holds 15 milligrams of uh, very fine na, uh, materials. No? So, after uh, putting the samples into the sample holder, you can mount the sample holder to the, um, to the machines. So here is the uh, uh, operational or the power buttons. So before we, we run you, before we run the samples, you no, know, make sure na your XRD and your laptop is connected to each connected to each other. So you will be using Wi-Fi, you no, know, and if connected to na, or if my Wi-Fi na. Uh, just type this uh, BTX IP code to the URL. So, lalabas yung site na kung saan makikita mong uh, kung ano yung nangyayari, nangyayari during uh, test of the sample. So, question. Gaano katagal iraran yung samples? How long does it take? Or, yun, ha, gaano katagal? So, uh, the maximum time is 20 20 minutes but if the uh, but when you see the graph no ito yung graph sa my computer uh, no longer move or change you can stop it no so kasi meaning uh, yung nadedetect nila is paulit-ulit na lang and then after pala noon uh, the download mo yung data so from this site and then analyze it through an XRD software. So in our case, now we use X powder software. So in this uh, software, uh, may already uh, input na yung standard reference data. So hindi na mahihirapang uh, maghanap pa ng uh, or mag ID ng minerals or ng crystalline materials. So in doing so, you only need to click the uh, database, then qualitative searching, and then advanced searching. So upon clicking the advanced searching, uh, the software will give you a list of possible um, crystalline materials or minerals that they detect based on the data that you input, no? that you open. So, so in actually the fraction drop, there is an X and Y axis. So in X axis, it uh, uh, records the it records the uh, the angle between the incident X rays and the uh, the fractal X ray beams. Well, the Y axis is the intensity, the X ray intensity. So you each phase produces a unique diffraction pattern. So yung phase is a specific chemistry and atomic arrangement. For example, uh, for example, yung quartz, cristobalite, and glass are different phase of SiO2. No? Meaning, uh, for example, yung SI, SiO2 is like the parents and yung quartz, cristobalite, and glass is the children. So they have uh, uh, chemical... Uh, Chemically, uh, they have a chemical, they have the same chemical composition, but different atomic structure. So like, uh, they have one blood, but different personality. So, ganun yung sa uh, face. Uh, ganun yung face. Um, so, uh, in, in actual um, data, no, the diffraction, pattern is a simple sum of the diffraction patterns of each individual phase. Uh, syempre, if you, the, the material is, ano, uh, tawag dito, hindi naman siya composed of one 
one one uh, one crystalline material or one minerals so madami siyang composition so for example if the material is composed of quartz crystallite and glass this will be their uh, the graph will be look like look like this no so pag sasamahin natin yung 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 diffraction pattern ng quartz crystallite in glass so as an example no so these are the xrd diffraction graph of the tagaytay asphalt that we analyzed no that uh, using the xrd powder method so you know it, these colorful sticks are the uh, mineral composition na na id namin or nakita namin dun sa tagaytay asphalt and this graph is yung recorded uh, a recorded X, uh, XRD diffraction pattern. So from the XRD pattern, you can determine the following. So what crystalline phases are in mixture, no? kung ano na yung mga minerals or crystalline materials na nasa mixture, how much of each crystalline phase is in the mixture, yung quant quantity, quantitative analysis. So how uh, how many is the uh, percentage of quartz uh, quartz does a, a mixture, no? So, and also, if any amorphous material is present in the mixture. So, first, a qualitative analysis of XRD data. The experimental XRD data are compared to the standard reference uh, data. No, so to determine what crystalline material are present. So as you can see, the, these color, colorful sticks represent as the standard reference data. No? And then, so the position and intensity of the reference sticks should match that data. So you collect natin graph. So a small amount of mismatch in peak position and intensity is acceptable as experimental error. For example, in this graph, but you can see the peak. Halos hindi nga sila nagmatch dun sa, dun sa graph. Ay, you can see the, the reference peak doesn't match to the peak of the graph. No? So meaning, hindi siya yung minerals para dun sa peak na yun. So there are there are other minerals path. So we need to disregard this um, reference material and to uh, to find another reference material na sa sakto dun sa um, dun sa peak. So what if kung pumasok naman lahat ng reference peaks dun sa peaks? So for example, this one, no yung quartz. So the reference materials is a quartz mineral. So lahat, you can see, no, lahat sila pasok. So uh, kapag ganito, uh, we need to find three, at least three highest peak na pasok yung reference peaks. So in this case, itong isa is one, two, and three. So merong three peaks na pasok. So meaning, itong pinks ito are identified as quartz minerals. So the the mineral composition, so the, the mixture has a quartz composition. So acceptable. So next naman po is yung, ah, so that's how the qualitative. How about the quantitative is, uh, it is easy, na, madali na lang siya, it is easy because yung software na mismo yung magko-compute at um, yung software na mismo yung magko-compute ng uh, percentage ng bawat uh, minerals doon sa mixture. So if you're using the X-Powder software, so you can see this uh, search engine, no? and on its left, you can see the quantitative buttons. Just click it, no? and then magraran na yung software. And after a minute, Ayan, ganito yung lalabas. So, the, this one is the quantitative analysis of 
Tagaytay Asphalt. So as you can see, no, yung uh, global armor force is 50. So meaning, halos kalahati ng uh, sample is glass texture or glass minerals. No, hindi siya crystalline. So the other uh, mineral is yung mostly I clay. So elite, no, then albite, splagio clays. So then makikita na natin yung percentage per uh, mineral composition. So the disadvantage of XRD is that if uh, more than one material may be compatible with one data. This happened kasi possible to because um, some minerals are uh, have the same atomic structure. No? So yes, they are different, in, different chemically, but uh, same yung atomic structure na so medyo may hirapan tayo ma-distinguish yun. And the next is the multi-mineralic or multi-phase multi samples can be difficult to interpret. This happens kapag more than five uh, crystalline materials you present doon sa mixture. Masyadong madaming uh, peaks kang hahanapin. No? So, and then next, the XRD analysis requires access to standard reference data. So, yung standard reference data, yung acceptable worldwide, no? yung pinaka-standard uh, characteristic ng isang minerals. So, yun, dapat yung software is meron na siyang standard reference data. So, uh, yun. So, sa software pala na ginagamit namin, the standard reference, reference data is the AMCD Mineral Database. So, then, the, sec, so, the last is the preparation of samples often requires grinding them down to a powder. So, um, medyo um, pag, pag prepare pa lang ng uh, samples is matrabaho na kasi kailangan talaga very fine. No? Dapat dadaan siya through 400 to 300 mesh sieve. So, and, and also, other disadvantage is that sa powder method kasi parang 15 milligram lang yung i- i- tawag dito, i-run or i-identify mo. So, may mga, may mga iba pang samples na pwedeng naiwan doon sa sieving, no? So, ayun. So, that's the end of my discussion and my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eloisa, for that very informative presentation. And I'm sure everyone has learned a lot about XRD. And now, let us delve on more about the applications of XRD on archaeological materials. So let me introduce to you the second speaker. He is the Senior Museum Researcher of Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Division. And he obtained his Master's of Science degree in Marine Science in, from Marine Science Institute of University of the Philippines, Diliman. And his current researches include stone materials and seagoing artilleries from different shipwrecks in the country. Let us all welcome Mr. Nero M. Ostero. All right, uh, good morning once again. Uh, thank you for that, Ms. Rachel. So um, my uh, presentation will be on the XRD analysis of uh, selected stone materials from the Earl Temple shipwreck. So I will not deal with the, the basics and the methodologies of XRD since it, was, uh, it has been elaboratively discussed by uh, Ms. Eloisa from the geology division. All right, so uh, just a very brief background of the Earl Temple. So uh, the Earl Temple is a company service of the East India Company in the early 1760s. So it was uh, about 499 tons, which is a rig merchant vessel that made round trip voyages between England and India 
and or Asia. So in December 1762, it arrived at the Port Marlborough in poor conditions. So it was sent, unfortunately, it was refused for repairs in Batavia, uh, modern Jakarta. Thus, in May 1763, it sailed towards uh, the Philippines and was unfortunately struck in a reef near the Paracel Islands. Okay, some technical, there you go. All right, so uh, the Earl Temple on uh, Shipwreck on the other hand, it was discovered by a local fisherman while collecting top shells, which are uh, used to make buttons, as well as sea cucumber in August, 1995. The fisherman cited nine to 11 anchors, cannons, stone balls, and stone slabs. In March, 1996, the same fisherman received about three pieces of stone balls, but uh, he only kept one and threw back the uh, other two, thinking that those uh, stones were not of uh, commercial value. Now, on between May 30 uh, to June 25 of 1996, the Western and Southern Palawan Underwater Archaeological Survey was uh, conducted. Uh, by the National Museum of the Philippines Underwater Archaeology Section in collaboration with the Underwater Archaeology Incorporated of Mr. Gilbert Fournier. So uh, the Earl Temple shipwreck was located at the Pagasa Island in Galayan Group of Islands in Palawan, which is about 454 miles southwest of Manila. Uh, these are the archaeological finds. So about 16 pieces of anchors, six cannons of various uh, sizes, various shapes, stone slabs, stone posts, stone pillars with architectural designs, various shapes, stone cannonballs, or various sized uh, stone cannonballs, as well as iron, stones, lead weights, gravestone markers, stone cannonballs, silver coins, copper coins, Cone weights and various metal items, uh, as well as glass stoppers. The iron anchors and the cannons has been dated to the 18th century or the British period. So this is the uh, theater reef or in Pagasa Island. All right, so these are just some of the archeological uh, objects found in the shipwreck. So again, there were six, uh, 16 anchors. So those photos were from uh, Mr. Gilbert uh, Fournier. Uh, these are the building stones that, was, uh, that were also featured in Maritime Monday in the official Facebook page of National Museum of the Philippines. Uh, these were believed to be used as uh, building materials for Hindu temples. Uh, this were the gravestone markers. So there were two actually. So first was also featured in the Maritime Monday post of the National Museum of the Philippine official Facebook page. So this gravestone belongs to an Armenian merchant uh, named Sultan David, also known as Baron Sultanum, with Latin and Armenian inscription. The next uh, or the other uh, gravestone marker belongs to uh, a certain Johannes Batista with an Arabic inscription. Uh, these are some of the uh, architectural materials uh, of those uh, with uh, Southern Indian provenance with motif that dates back to the 11th and 12th centuries, as well as uh, between 16 to the 17th centuries, uh, typical of Tamil Nadu regions. These are the in-situ images of cannons found in the shipwrecks. And these stone cannonballs actually were also featured in the Maritime Mandy post of the National Museum uh, Facebook page. So at the right is the in-situ image of stone cannonballs uh, along with other stone materials.
These are the coins, uh, include silver coins, copper coins, and coin weights. As well as uh, various metal objects. And also uh, glass stoppers and lead weights. All right, so for the XRT analysis, by the way, um, as was mentioned by uh, Ms. Uh, Magdalas a while ago, that uh, this method is actually uh, destructive. So we choose to, uh, very, uh, to be very careful uh, during the methods or the process of analysis. So uh, in my case, I used um, very small chips uh, from the rock materials, about five grams to, I mean, five milligrams to 10 milligrams only. And then uh, they were pulverized before uh, the analysis. So um, the XRD methods or techniques have already been um, with proven reliability in the field. So these uh, methods were broadly used in characterization of various crystalline materials of archeological, historical, and artistic interest uh, materials. So XRD is also a fast, uh, diagnostic and reasonable method used uh, for mortars, black stones, and other uh, crystalline materials. In the Philippines, uh, XRD method was also used to uncover hematite or uh, Fe203 along with other minerals from human remains covered with a red pigment, uh, specifically red ochre. Also, XRD has been used as a pre-evaluation method before dating uh, investigation of tridacna shells found in the Philippines. So uh, this is just to show you the histogram of the results of the uh, XRD analysis of those building stones. By the way, we used about 13 building stones um, from the shipwreck or earth temple shipwreck. So uh, these results has been made possible with the help of uh, staff from the geology division of the National Museum of the Philippines. And with their expertise, uh, we're able to arrive at the correct or the uh, results of XRD analysis. So based on XRD results, the major minerals identified includes or include chlorite, codonite, elminite, magnetite, magnesite, quartz, cristobalite, biotite, amphiboles, pyroxene, and plagioclase. Results uh, further showed that the plagioclase minerals were the dominant in all uh, specimens. Also, all the stone materials has higher sodic and calcic plagioclase. This uh, assemblage of minerals were uh, typical to spilitic basalts or espilites. So the specimens, all of the specimens were identified as sp spilitic basalt or espilite, which is a sodium rich basalt that forms along the ocean ridges and volcanic parks. A minor amount of iron and magnesium oxides such as magnetite, elminite and magnesite. These minerals actually were observed during hand specimen analysis where all stones um, have shown magnetism. It reacts with uh, magnets. And also these racks or the espelites were usually used in construction industry as rock aggregates and materials for cobblestone making. So what are the, the significance of using this uh, methodology uh, in application with uh, material, I mean, archeological materials? So basically uh, the stones were identified as a spilitic basalt or espelites using XRD method, which is in contrast with the previous identification of the stones as granite stones. Also its identification provided further insights into their provenance and source rock materials. For example, um, Susan Shoup in 1997 actually has a very good literature on how she discovered or uh, she identified the shipwreck as the Earl Temple shipwreck. So it was sometime in 17, uh, uh, 1760s that a war broke 
that lasted about uh, more than two years between the French uh, regiments and the British uh, armies. So basically that war has caused uh, so much havoc in the town of Puddencherry that it topples down the buildings, including the, uh, the, the architectural, uh, architectural buildings as well as the churches and even the cemeteries. So sometime in the spring of 1762, the Earl Temple a vessel uh, calls for Madras and was uh, in need of more uh, ballasting materials. And then those rubbles or stone rubbles from the wreckage of war in Puddencherry actually give uh, enough uh, supplies of ballasting materials. And uh, according to Susan Shoup, that could have been the reason why the Armenian gravestone has been found on board the vessel or the Earl Temple. So it is also interesting to note that uh, that uh, literature, as well as the result of this study, has confirmed that those stones were actually from India. So the Deccan lava, for instance, or for example, which is, uh, I mean, which are traditional known as the Deccan traps or homogeneous basalts, encompasses about 200 square miles, 200,000 square miles, covering a large part of Kutch, Katwar, Gujarat, Deccan, Central India, Central and uh, provinces of India. Also, uh, literatures have um, also done or mentioned occurrences and geology of spolitic basalts in India. And uh, minerals, albite, and consequent sodalite, which are primary contents of espalites, were also found from Mandi, Himachal Pradesh in India, as well as the existence of espolitic basalts in Bombay, present day Mumbai, in Chetaldorga, Mysore, and Kethia and Daman in India. So, well, if we base that on the, uh, well, if we consider the geographical factors as well as the logistics, and probably the limited transport options during that period, it could be inferred that those stones can be sourced or were sourced from the Mysore and Chitaldorga areas in India, uh, knowing that they are just approximately about 443 kilometers and 516 kilometers uh, from Pondicherry, uh, respectively. Okay, so that would be all for my presentation. Thank you. All right, so uh, once again, good morning. So I'll be the one to introduce to you our third speaker. Uh, she's a graduate of uh, BS Chemistry at uh, UP Diliman and has uh, master's uh, units of material science. She's currently the museum researcher of the Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Division. Her current researches include material culture analysis using non-destructive spectroscopy techniques. That's all welcome, Ms. Rachel Oreta. Thank you very much for that introduction, Sir Nero. So for today's forum, I will be discussing about the introduction to, spe to spectroscopy techniques and their applications in archaeometry. So for this discussion, we are talking about archaeological objects. So with that, it is important to know what is archaeology. So archaeology is the study of human life ways through material culture. And this material finds are the main source of archaeological knowledge. So this material finds can be recovered from terrestrial or underwater sites. And this, the scientific analysis of these objects can help interpret many aspects of archaeological interests, like 
provenance, uh, manufacturing processes, or production technologies. And these insights can often be used for further historical interpretation. So when we deal with material culture studies, um, we often encounter archaeometry. So archaeometry is the application of scientific methods and technology to archaeological study. So it can be considered as a bridge between humanities, such as archaeology and art history, and natural sciences, such as chemistry, physics, biology, and geology. So this is a wide range of studies that can be defined as the application of scientific techniques for the knowledge and characterization of artifacts and their involvement with humans and environment. So the applications or the study of archaeometry involves um, provenance investigations, um, trace elements analysis, chemical composition and isotopes, production techniques of artifacts, even conservation science, bioarchaeology, and human environment interactions. So the major um, discoveries, major archaeological discoveries are made with um, with the big help of material analysis using laboratory equipment or analytical equipment. And when we do material analysis, usually we aim for a non-destructive or non-invasive method. And what do we mean by saying non-destructive? So non-destructive are techniques are the methods that do not consume the sample during the analysis. Well, non-invasive techniques are um, techniques that require no sampling of the artifact, and it implies that direct analysis is performed. So the object and the laboratory instrumentation are in such a way that the artifact can be analyzed, typically by causing no damage or only micro damage. So basically, um, the term non-destructive um, is on sample level only, while the term non-invasive is on the um, whole object itself. So basically non-invasive is non-destructive. So also as we um, do archeological study, we often um, do in situ studies. So in situ studies is the direct investigations where the instrumentation is brought outside the laboratory to the cultural um, heritage object. So for example, the handheld equipment or portable equipment are brought to a archeological site to examine the artifacts in situ or the rock art or even the exhibitions in the museum, the artifacts displayed there. So the aim of the analysis is to minimize any potential damage to the material while obtaining as much valuable information as possible. So the ideal method in analysis of archaeological material should be non-destructive, fast, sensitive, multi-elemental and universal. And most of these characteristics are found in spectroscopy techniques. So we, this makes them the most, one of the most preferred methods in archaeometric studies. Okay, so what is spectroscopy? So the spec spectroscopy is the study of the inter interaction of radiant energy and matter, and it is the dispersion of an object's light into its component colors or energies. So it, uh, its basis is the electromagnetic spectrum. So we can see here that um, the light is often broken down into specific regions of an electromagnetic spectrum. And each region of this spectrum has a particular type of spectroscopy associated with it. 
So for example, in the visible um, region, it is where the different wavelengths are responsible of the colors that we see. So for example, a, a, a light um, passed through a green leaf, um, the absorbed colors will be red and orange. So what the colors that we see are the reflected light, which will produce the color green. And fortunately in the museum, we have uh, um, spectroscopy equipment for the non, invasive or non-destructive analysis of our um, objects. So it will be the X-ray fluorescence or XRF for your transform infrared or FTIR and Raman spectroscopy. So for the first method, the handheld X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. So XRF can also um, it has also an equipment which is a tabletop or it can be a portable or handheld. So what we have in the museum is a handheld XRF. So it, the handheld X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy is a non-invasive analytical technique which utilizes a primary X-ray source to determine the elemental composition of a material. So it is very advantageous because it can provide rapid testing with qualitative and semi-quantitative results. So how does it work? So when an X-ray beam irradiates a sample, um, it causes a, a displacement of electrons. So an energy will be released. So the em uh, emitted radiation will um, cause um, difference of energy, and this is what we call the fluorescence. So it, uh, the fluorescence will be um, detected by the analyzer, which will be shown on the equipment. And since every element has a unique uh, set of um, fluorescence, um, XRF can um, be used for qualitative and semi-quantitative analysis. So. The applications of um, XRF include ceramic composition, um, pigment identification, metal composition um, in conservation, soil analysis, and also stone and glass studies. So it also has a limitation. So the limits of detection of this instrument is from magnesium to uranium, meaning it um, cannot detect the light elements, for example, the sodium um, from the row, two rows above of the periodic table. So these are the light elements which cannot be detected by the XRF. So another limitation is that um, it can only analyze the surface of a sample. So it cannot be, it cannot reflect the whole composition of an object. I will now um, present some of the preliminary investigations that we uh, did for um, our shipwreck materials using the XRF. So one example is these broad, uh, metal rings. So from observation, we can see the green, um, the green layer or the green um, corrosion layer. So from this, we can deduce that it is a copper alloy because um, the green layer can indicate the um, oxidation of copper. But we still don't know if it is a brass or a bronze. So if it is a brass, the major components should be copper and zinc. And if it is a bronze, it should be copper and tin. So when we did the two major elements detected. The copper is 48.96% and the tin is 
23.92%. So we identified that um, these metal rings are bronze rings. So this came from a 13th century shipwreck from um, Pawikan Shoal. And um, we can say that this are purposely hidden because at this period, the Chinese imperial government uh, prohibited the export of these metals. So another example are the um, analysis of glass beads. So we can see the uh, elemental composition of each type of beads. So here we can see the high level of silica and also uh, lead and also calcium oxide. So from here, um, we can see the glass former is the silica and with the high level of lead, um, we also identify that these beads are a Chinese glass bead type because of its high level of uh, lead. And also we can see here or identify the colorants used for each um, beads. For example, for the blue colored beads, um, cup, uh, cobalt, the amount of cobalt or copper may be the colorant used. So another one is the examination of a celadon shirt from a 13th century shipwreck. So a celadons are known for their green glazes. And for the ceramics, usually kaolinite kaul is the predominant initial clay mineral and also montmorillonite. So various compositions of Elites and other minerals such as quartz, feldspar, calcite, and iron compounds can also be found. So we can see that um, we have here the high content of silica and also aluminum and calcium. Okay, so next, uh, next method is the Raman spectroscopy. So Raman spectroscopy is a non-destructive analytical technique commonly used to provide a structural fingerprint to identify mo molecules. So this method is capable of detecting the shift in the frequency caused by vibrational energies of molecules. So it is mainly based on the vibrational energies and its application include pigment analysis, glass and glazes, mineral identification, conservation, and even chemical structure and identity. So the equipment, the Raman equipment that we have in the museum is a tabletop. It is the Horiba Explora Plus. So it is equipped with a um, microscope and also, it has a software to analyze the spectra for the results. And also, it has a limited database that we can use to, for the processing of data. So this also has a limitations. It can't be used for metals or alloys because Raman spectroscopy is also based on um, polarizability. So metals don't have that. And Sample heating through the intense laser radiation can destroy the sample. So you need also to know what type of laser to use to prevent um, uh, the destruction of sample, even in micro level only. And it is also difficult to obtain an accurate Raman spectrum on amorphous materials due to the lack of their crystalline structure. So this is, um, we experienced this case in analyzing glass beads. So an example of Raman spectroscopy analysis on shipwreck material is for the celadon shirt. For the glazed part, 
This is the resulting spectrum with the peaks on 460, 193, and 124. So as I have said, the Raman spectroscopy equipment uh, is equipped with um, database, but sometimes the resulting spectra does not match on any database. So we have to do um, manual analysis of the spectra or there are available reference spectrum libraries online, which are free. Um, we can use the RROF or the IROG, the infrared and Raman users group. So here um, they have the database of published Raman spectra. And we can use this as reference for the um, resulting spectra. So from here, we deduce that the Raman bands shown is an indication of silica vibrations that indicates quartz crystals. So we also identified the, or we also analyzed the body or the cross section of the shirt. And the resulting spectra shows the peaks from 152 to 05, 708, and 1087. So from the reference spectrum libraries, we got this um, calcium ca carbonate mineral. So for a calcium carbonate mineral, we don't know what type of um, polymorph it is. So it can be a calcite or an argonite. So they also have different type of spectra. And we can see here the, uh, from the reference spectra, um, the blue bands or the blue peaks um, indicates the aragonite and the calcite is for the uh, red one. So by comparative analysis, we can see that the resulting spectrum is for aragonite. And also the non-detection of uh, iron-based crystals may indicate a total dilution, dilution of iron oxide in the glaze, which is distinctive for high quality celadons. So it may be, it is possible that the celadon shirt is from the Longchuan um, kiln site, since at this period, they produced high quality um, celadon wares. So the last spectroscopy technique is the handheld Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy or FTIR. So this is a non-invasive vibrational analytical technique commonly used to determine the molecular structure of a material. So it measures the absorbance, transmittance, and reflectance of infrared radiation resulting from its interaction with the sample. So one limitation of this is that it is also not suitable for metal analysis. And its application involves mineral composition, pigment studies, conservation studies, stone and glass studies. So uh, the equipment that we have is also handheld. And for the data interpretation, um, we have this um, functional group analysis. So for every band, um, it has a uh, um, equivalent um, composition or functional group. So the FTIR is also equipped with a database which you can um, match the resulting spectrum, but it is also limited. So you have sometimes, or most of the time, you have to do manual analysis of the peaks. So we also use the IROG, the one I said earlier, the database, which is free to get a reference spectra. And this is also a reference for um, ceramic analysis. So this equivalent, equivalent peaks indicates the composition of the uh, material. So we also refer to this. And this is uh, the resulting spectrum of the celadon shirt, which indicates the presence of silicates from the peaks.
And um, to conclude, um, spectroscopy analysis is very useful in archaeometry, but each equipment or technique has its limitations also. So you have also um, need to know these limitations and how to um, analyze or interpret the data that was gathered here. Thank you very much for listening. Now that I have um, give you a short introduction about the spectroscopy techniques, um, let us learn more about the applications of these techniques to um, paintings. The last topic will be presented by two resource persons. So the first is Ms. Camille Calano, who is a museum researcher too from Ethnology Division. And her current research work focuses on conservation and collection management of ethnographic materials. She also has a background on conservation of artworks. And the second speaker is Ms. Jonaline Cornelio. So she is a museum technician of a fine arts division. And she attended different trainings locally and internationally, um, like in Agilent University, which focused on FTIR spectroscopy. And she also do conservation works for paintings and pigments. So let us all welcome Ms. Camille Calano and Ms. Jonaline Cornelio. Thank you, Rachel, for that introduction. Uh, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Um, dito po kami ni John Nalin to explain further uh, yung other uses na um, spectro spectroscopy when it comes to ano naman, paintings, uh, artworks, and other ethnographic materials. So I'm here to speak as a former researcher from the Fine Arts Division. So magka-work po kami ni John Nalin sa several projects before. Uh, fine arts. So, yeah. So, we'll be discussing further and explaining ni, ni Ms. Rachel the introduction about elemental and molecular analysis of, uh, of uh, underwater, maritime and underwater cultural heritage materials naman for paintings. That's my book. Next slide, please. So as a disclaimer, habang hindi pa nag next slide, um, hindi po ako scientist. So arts major po ako. More on cultural heritage po talaga yung aking ginagawa. More on preventive conservation. So I'm here to uh, just discuss yung uh, relation ng um, preventive conservation sa uh, material analysis or yung mga ginagawa talaga ng scientists. So here, you can see sa in your screens, uh, I saw this in a book. Uh, this uh, describes kung ano ba yung purpose, kung bakit ba tayo gumagawa ng scientific analysis. Kasi di ba parang, okay, cultural heritage painting. So more on art, di ba? So bakit, ano, bakit natin pinag-uusapan yung uh, science dito? So as you can see here, uh, it's a collaborative work uh, between Ito sa left side, so yung mga archaeologists, art historians, uh, conservators, curators. And on the right side, you uh, from the natural sciences, so yung mga chemists, material scientists, mineralogists. As napansin na natin uh, for the first um, three presentations. So kanina, di ba napansin natin na um, yung much D or yung sa maritime and underwater, they work hand in hand uh, with uh, the geology division then for um, scientific analysis. So, hindi pwedeng 
um, isa lang yung nag-decide when it comes to conservation. I'm speaking in the perspective of a conservator, Preve- more on preventive conservator. Hindi pwede like, ikaw lang magde-decide na, okay, ito yung, uh, i-apply kong technique or uh, analysis dito sa isang painting, for example. And then, ako lang yung nag-decide on my own. Hindi pwede ganun. So, you have to consult. For example, a chemist should, should consult a conservator or a museum curator kung ano ba yung gusto nilang kuning information from, for example, a pigment. Uh, ano ba yung purpose of for that? So, yun. Kailangan, nasa gitna yung scientific analysis pagdating sa collaboration. Next slide, please. So, what are the roles of analytical chemistry in cultural heritage projects? So, first is to provide answers to questions about the conservation state of cultural heritage assets. So, uh, sa mga paintings, for example, may mga uh, donations or mga na-acquire kaming um, paintings na previously restored. So, uh, I can say previously previously restored minsan kasi obvious pa lang. Pag tinignan mo pa lang, obvious na may in-painting or para may mga dagdag na uh, medyo kakaiba, hindi fluid yung itsura sa surface, parang ganyan. So, doon papasok yung analytical chemistry. So, ano ba yung mga paints na nagamit? Uh, for example, before, meron kaming kakolaborate na researcher from Australia. So, pumunta siya sa National Museum uh, in examine namin yung paintings ni Vincente, Vincente, national artist Vincente Maransala. So, she wanted to know kung ano bang paints yung ginamit ni Vincente Maransala through the years. So, um, yung mga oldest uh, paintings niya um, contains zinc, zinc white, and ah, no, so sorry, sorry, lead white. So, Pag sinabing lead white, even sa uh, European countries, or yun, uh, nag-start siya gamitin during the late 19th century to the early 20th century. So, yun yung kadalas ang ginagamit na ground or yung parang first paint on the canvas, yung white. So, na-identify siya as lead white. And then, napansin na parang during the uh, middle of the 20th century, yun yan, um, zinc white na yung mas ginagamit kasi yung lead is uh, harmful na gamitin. So, sa mga ganong pagkakataon, um, doon pumapasok yung importance ng analytical chemistry. So, nalalaman natin kung ano ba talaga yung ginamit ng mga artists before na paints. And at the same time, pagpasok naman ng conservation, for example, kailangan namin mag-restore or mag-conserve. Uh, we have to use the same kind of paint or material na ginamit ng artist para hindi maiba yung intention ng artist. So, may mga ganong, um, kumbaga para may ethics na din, when it comes, actually ethics talaga siya, when it comes to conservation, of course, we respect kung ano yung ginagamit ng artist. And at the same time, if you introduce another um, uh, material, or for example, another paint, um, or varnish, for instance, pwede kasing mag yun na, instead na na-conserve mo yung painting, pwede siyang mag ng further damage. So, yung mga ganun bagay, ka important yung analytical analysis pagdating din sa study of pigments. And then, another uh, role is to create multidisciplinary teams. So, ayun nga, na-mention ko na nag-work hand-in-hand yung WatchD and Geology. Uh, at the same time ako, sa, from ethnology na ngayon, I work with the archaeology, archaeology division kasi meron kaming similar... Um, uh, objects na present sa aming collections and at the same time I still work with the fine arts division kasi meron din kami for example mga textiles na painted mga ganyan so uh, if you've been to the National Museum you can see siguro minsan na nasa um, National Museum of Anthropology ka pero may makikita ka biglang painting ganyan. so that's how we um, work hand in hand with each other. So, hindi yun nga, as I said earlier, na hindi nga pwede, isa lang yung nag-decide when it comes to conservation. You have to consult different people, the um, the best people na makakatulong dun sa iyong study. Another role is, well, ito, different instruments are used for different purposes. Na-mention ni Miss Rachel kanina. So, 
hindi pwedeng gumamit ng FTIR, for example, for uh, metals. Kasi well, hindi, parang useless kasi hindi rin naman madedetect yung kailangan madedetect dun sa metals. Ganyan. Uh, uh, XRF for metals naman. Ganyan. So, you really have to um, know kung ano, yung, ano ba yung purpose ng study mo. Uh, may times na pwedeng sabay ganitin yung XRF and F, uh, sorry, and FTIR, ganyan. Um, hindi enough yung XRF so kailangan mag FTIR tapos um, kapag nag-sampling ka um, kailangan pa ng mga um, SEM yung sa mga microscope ganyan so mas for me uh, may, may, as a preventive conservator pag nakita ko sa isang object na kailangan ko malaman to kasi kunwari dinonate sa amin tapos walang anything walang provenance walang kung anong material yun of course we have to put it sa database namin ba diba? So, dalapit ako dyan kaila Rachel, kaila Jonalyn, kaila uh, Miss Eloisa, parang uh, patulong kung uh, pa-identify using the equipment na meron kami sa National Museum yeah, to identify kung anong material yung object na yun para hindi na siya ma-dissociate. So, isang agent of deterioration ang dissociation. So, nakakatulong yung analytical, analytical equipment for identification and provenance na din and pag-provide na din ng um pag parang dates pag date hindi sa ano specific dates but yung range ko kunya rin kailan to ginawa somehow ganyan so yun kailangan ng combination of different uh, equipment and then lastly yun nga identification of pigments elements and materials so important siya for us sa ethnology division naman um Marami kaming mga metal objects na nakalagay sa aming card catalog, ka- catalogs na metal lang. As in, parang metal. Ganun, ganyari. Uh, musical instrument na nakalagay metal. So, madaming metals. So, doon papasok yung use na XRF para i-identify kung anong kind of metal. So, nalaman namin na ito palang group, group of instruments ay made of brass. So, saan ba in the Philippines? things na nagkaroon ng metal working before during this time with this kind of metal. So yun, so, so but parang makaka-move on ka na with your research pagdating naman sa um, historical records, ganyan. So i-compare mo na, i-cross-check mo na pagdating sa um, mga theories, pagdating naman sa art. So sa kung saan nag-start yung use ng mga ganitong kinds of materials, yun. So Actually, yun lang po yung aking talk this morning. The, the importance of um, collaboration when it comes to um, using analytical methods or techniques uh, and kung ano yung um, purpose or yung role ng mga conservator, ng mga curators, art historians pag nag-work with sila with the chemists, mineralogists. Yeah. So, uh, si Ms. Jonalyn will discuss for, even further yung mga projects na nagawa with the Fine Arts Division uh, with the use of XRF and FTIR. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Camille. Again, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending. And as mentioned before or a while ago, I'll be discussing about some, te- some technical techniques that can be used in achieving... Uh, better preservation, as mentioned by Camille, and conservation of cultural heritage. This will also increase our knowledge in art and archaeological objects through advanced chemical and physical analysis. So the focus of this topic, uh, my lecture topic, is the analytical techniques for the examination of cultural heritage. Uh, includes also, as discussed by Mr. Nero and Ms. Rachel, uh, research examples for the application of this chemical and physical analysis through on our cultural heritage materials in by the uh, application on painted works of art, ceramics, glazes, and metals. In addition to that, I will be discussing a fine arts application with the development of portable techniques to perform analysis. So, okay. Uh, non-invasive, as this, ca- this is also discussed by Ms. Rachel, so papahapyawan ko na lang po. Non-invasive, elemental, and 
molecular analysis. So it means no sample preparation or non-destructive and the portability of this equipment allow us for in situ analysis. The elemental methods includes XRF or the X-ray fluorescence, both for technique for the spot analysis and elemental mapping. So in molecular methods, we are having FDIR spectroscopy or the FDIR spectroscopy. So next slide, please. Uh, I'll be sharing to you itong isa pang technique na pwede natin gamitin. As part of the technical process or the, doc or the documentation purposes, diba, as the first stage in physical or condition examination of the paintings, we have to do photography of the artworks using visible light, or uh, natural light source uh, to have that record or the, the ID of the works. So this image includes the views of the artworks all around or from all sides. So we can have images such as observation under raking light photography. This is a useful technique or a method for the examination of the works of art or archaeology archaeology so in so it is part of the technical photography documentation and allows to detect and document uh, surface features this is also used to document retouching loses of paintings as well as the study of painting techniques uh, since it makes clear the brush works, as you can see in the illustration. Uh, also the layer of paints. Uh, this is also a technique uh, that we're in illuminated from one side source ng light uh, at an oblique angle in relation to its surface. So makikita natin talaga yung details. For example, here in the warping of the artwork, so kitang kita siya by those shadows na na-create ng raking light. So next slide po. Yan. As mentioned here, it is very simple method yung raking light photography. It reveals and document numerous information. As you can see in this photo of, at your left, the visible photo, the visible photo intended to reproduce the look or the image of the artwork as seen as same sa nakikita natin sa museum having normal light or, or normal normal light source so here in the left in the right photo the raking light photo photograph it clearly shows how the paint was laid and the texture details so this Photographs are essential tools for the documentation of the artworks, especially uh, in recording the techniques, as mentioned by Camille, uh, the techniques of the artist, their signatures, uh, the restorations, uh, the possible damages, encryptions, the labels, and etc. Next, please. So, the next one is the dynolite mic microscopy. As mentioned before, that the first step is to take photos uh, to the artworks in natural light. So this is a common technique nowadays. So camera resolution must be take note then uh, or must be considered as an important parameter to obtain the detailed image setup. So yun po ang tinatawag natin na macro photography. This is a good technique to observe the artwork in detail. And when an area looks interesting for some details or for some studies, we investigate more deeply. So we can do this using this DinoLite digital microscope. This is also a handheld digital microscope, uh, which connects directly to our laptop or to our computer through USB port. This uh, it also includes software for imaging and measuring and also for recording. So this is a powerful tool with a special range of microscopes and accessories tailored to fit the needs 
of the art conservators or the artists, allowing us to walk on through the region of interest, magnifying the surface up to the 50 times optical magnification or optical zoom. So next. So this is an example, as you can see in the photo, uh, an example of macro photograph. This is Vicente Manansala's artwork, film collection entitled Is That. Uh, as you can see here, we have labeled areas of interest. Yan, may makikita po kayong nakalabel. And here are the magnification gathered in next slide. Uh, these were examined with a digital microscope. Uh, our model in the National Museum is the DinoLite AN 2011. This is analysis, in this analysis, you can see the 50 times magnification of the paint details. Uh, yan, makikita nyo po dyan. It was revealed wherein may mga minor losses. So, through sa unang tingin natin by our naked eye, hindi natin to makikita. But using this digital microscope, uh, we can magnify 50 times. So, makikita talaga natin yung mga paint details marireveal talaga siya dyan. So yan, that's the use of our DinoLite microscope. So, next slide, please. So our next instrument used in fine arts is the portable XRF or the X-ray fluorescence analyzer. The purpose of this PXRF analysis is to characterize the inorganic pigments used in the series, as well as any inorganic substances present in the paint mixture. So the question is, how does the XRF technology work? Next slide, please. So as you can see in the parts of the spectrometer, uh, this is discussed by Rachel Nara. Uh, so, papa, ano yung lang dito. When an analyzer, makita niyo dito, emits the X-ray that hit the sample, for example, paintings, this can cause elements in the sample to fluorescence and travel back to the analyzer X-ray detector. And the analyzer counts and makes mathematical calculation to generate a result. So, uh, yung X-ray, was characterized by energies lying between the ultraviolet, ultraviolet and the gamma radiation. So when X-ray interact with the material or the atomic at the atomic level, they can be absorbed and can cause fluorescence. So kaya X or by X-ray fluorescence siya. So uh, next please. So here in the National Museum, we are having this model the Genus 7000 XRF uh, produced by Skyray with, uh, with these accessories. Uh, this can be carried in the field or in situ analysis. So what can XRF analyzer detect? Next, please. So XRF analyzer measure elements from magnesium to uranium. This is a powerful non-destructive technique for measure, measuring elemental composition for the magnesium to uranium from PPM or parts per million to 100%. Uh, this is also uh, good or the best to identify elemental and chemical composition of an object. Basically, XRF, is the most important of this interaction is the absorption of X-ray. So next, please. So handheld operation of the XRF analyzer in the museum. So in this illustration from your left, uh, we're in the placement of sheet uh, in isolating materials to the nose of proper nose protection. Makita niyo po dyan. Kumbaga yan po yung sa front. Ayan po yung parang bunga nga ng XRF. So, and the two proper hand positions on a handheld XRF instrument. As you can see, 
most handheld XRF spectrometers are designed to be operated by placing the nose of the instrument direct contact with the surface of the object to be analyzed. So it is good practice po to make sure that the nose of the instrument is clean by wiping it before moving the instrument from one spot to another spot para ma-prevent po natin ang probable uh, cross-contamination. So application of sheet, pwede din po mag gumamit tayo ng etafoam or glycine. So in general, it is safer to adhere the isolating layer to the nose of the uh, XRF taking care not to cover the X-ray aperture, the cameras, or the instrument uh, to have uh, proper spectrum collection or para makakollect natin yung spectrum. Uh, next, please. Uh, also, we can have tripod positioning of the XRF analyzer. This is for extended accessions or for objects simple, having simple geometry or in a planar object such as paintings, photographs, uh, drawings. This is the easiest and safest uh, positioning the tri using tripod or other mechanical support. Regardless of what support you have in a tripod setup, make sure that the instrument is securely mounted para hindi po siya malalaglag that may cause uh, damage to the artworks to be analyzed. So, ayun. So, next please. So, here is an example of interpreting the data and reporting results of XRF. As you can see here, hindi masyado ano yung, here yung display. Uh, as you can see, the result on the display of the spectrometer, we're in probable major elements, uh, makikita natin on top. And the minor and the trace elements are indicates also in element present with uh, having lesser quantities or percent contents. Kasi dito makikita po natin yung con percent content, also the percent error, depending on the mode or the elements we are analyzing. Next, please. So under elemental analysis, uh, using XRF in the sample works of art, uh, we can, we, as you can see here, the bold, the bold font denotes the major elements. And the Roman font indicates also the elements with lesser quantities and the italic the italic one have or consider as minor or trace relative amounts so and also we can have the possible pigments which give us clue on our chemical characterization or pigment identification so this is very useful para magkaroon na tayo ng clue for possible pigments like here, we have uh, pointing to the red-orange angel. Uh, this is a description. So the major element is the lead, uh, followed, by the, followed by the trace element. Mercury having the trace relative amount of copper and iron. So we have a possible clue of red lead. So... So magkakaroon tayo ng clue for the possible pigments to be confirmed pa rin yun. So very big na yun na uh, bibigay sa atin ng XRF for our chemical characterization. So next please. So the last technique is the FTIR spectroscopy. So after the imaging techniques or the elemental composition analysis using uh, Dynolite and XRF, we will now confirm what we want to, dis to be to discover about the nature of pigments, for example. Not just pigments, but also its coatings, other components, or other components of paintings. 
FTIR or the Fourier transfer transform infrared spectroscopy is a technique used to collect high spectral resolution data, which measure in intensity over narrow ratio of wavelength at a time. So, meron din siyang x and y axis. The x is the wave number and y axis is the absorbance or the having the absorbance unit. So here in the National Museum, we are having this model, the 4,300 handheld FAR spectrometer, we, uh, weighing less than two kilograms. Uh, this is also compact and portable system, having the ideal mobile non-destructive testing uh, advan of an advanced materials uh, we can use this in field or then laboratory environments. So it also have easy to use microlab software, the uh, microlab software. So how it works? Next slide, please. So as this is also discussed earlier by Ms. Rachel, so FTR instrument sends IR radiation for about 10,000 to 100 cm per cm through a sample uh, with some radiation absorbed or some, and when it passes through, the absorbed radiation is converted into rotational or vibrational energy by the sample molecules. So the resulting signal at the detector present as the spectrum from the scale of 4,000 to 400 per cm. Uh, this can be shown by in the scale of a spectra from the 4,000 to 400 per cm. So FTR analysis is a great tool for chemical identification. That's why we have this spectral or we have this reference chart for spectral readings. So this is also, next slide po. Uh, this is also shown by Ms. Rachel. We have patterns. So take note that uh, in, a spectral, in spectral readings, we, this is a big help for us to identify the sample or the spectral sample since, the, since every molecule or every compound have a specific IR fingerprints. So walang, walang, pare, walang pare parehang spectra ang bawat molecule. So as mentioned by Ms. Rachel, FDR have been also used successfully in the studies of uh, archaeological sites, pottery, polychrome works, and other works of arts. So in fine art application, the identification of coatings on materials can prove to be a challenging task. So especially when samples look identical to the eye, coatings are excellent example of the material that can be identified as most coatings or primers and bonding materials are made to be organic compounds. So like this one. So next slide, please. So the identification of coatings on materials can be proved to be a challenging task talaga. So uh, look at this one. So sample have identical to our eye. So coatings are example, it's an excellent example of the material analysis, which can be identified on most coatings, primers, and some organic. So in this figure, example, FTR with a diffuse, this is captured by FTR with a diffuse reflectance sampling interface, determining the difference between the polyvinyl chloride or the PVC, the polyurethane, a PU, or the polyvinylidine chloride or the F or the PVDF. So as you can see here in the spectra, it shows that these are easily distinguishable from one another. So in this sample case, me merely viewing and visib visibly identical samples. So without having the 
right or the having the spectral reading correctly we can choose wrong coatings or this can lead to the fail failure of application in our especially in restoration so by using FTR analysis we can prove that to be that this technique or this analysis is very beneficial in chemical identification by using elemental and or by considering the elemental and molecular analysis by data gathering to have the accurate materials to be used by to be used in our restoration or conservation treatment procedures so this will help us in determining the physical qualities of the coatings to be used or the or with this will also give us clue for the paint paint binders or anything materials to be used in painting or any works of arts uh, preservation or conservation treatment uh, for us to use also in stability monitoring so i think that would be all for my topic thank you so much for Thank you very much, Ms. Camille and Ms. Jonna, for that very interesting presentation. We have learned a lot about the different um, analytical techniques used in painting analysis as well as in conservation. And if you have any questions, you may send them through the Zoom chat box or the comment box section on YouTube and then we will organize it and ask them later at the open forum. But before the open forum, we are very excited to launch the exhibition virtual tour. So in celebration of the Maritime and Archipelagic Nation Awareness Month, as well as the Civil Service Month, the National Museum of the Philippines virtually launches the 300 years of maritime trade in the Philippines exhibition or in Filipino ang tatlong daang taong kalakalang pandagat sa Pilipinas. This exhibition showcases the material evidence recovered from shipwrecks it's found in the Philippines dated from the 13th, 15th, and 16th century CE. It highlights seven shipwrecks, the Breaker Reef, Pawican Shoal, Pandanan, Lena Shoal, Santa Cruz, San Isidro and Kanduli Show. These underwater cultural resources represents the different aspects of maritime trade in the Philippines for 300 years. Friends and colleagues, everyone, may we present to you the 300 years of maritime trade in the Philippines exhibition virtual tour. In celebration of the Maritime and Archipelagic Nation Awareness Month, the National Museum of the Philippines launches the upgraded 300 Years of Maritime Trade in the Philippines exhibition at the second floor hallway gallery of the National Museum of Anthropology. This exhibition aims to share with the public the significant artifacts and their history gathered through archaeological research and to raise awareness on the museum's role in the protection and management of underwater cultural heritage resources in the Philippines. It showcases the material evidence that was archaeologically recovered from seven shipwreck sites dated from 13th, 15th, and 16th century CE. These sites are part of our underwater cultural heritage that offer valuable historical information and are testimony to trade and cultural dialogue between people and nations. However, these resources are vulnerable to various threats from human activities and natural processes. Thus, the protection and management of these sites are a priority and a challenge. 
This exhibition reveals that 300 years before the arrival of the Spanish naval expedition in the early 16th century CE, the local population in the present-day Philippines have already engaged in international trading with ports and polities of Southeast Asia, China, and Indian Ocean states, and traders from far and wide geographies meet and exchange an extensive range of commodities. In the 13th century, the overland Silk Road commercial route became largely inoperable, causing a redirection of trade routes from land to the seas. The Maritime Silk Road, as it came to be called, stretched from the Mediterranean to southern China, traversing the Red Sea, Indian Ocean, and South China Sea. There are two shipwreck sites featured in this section, the Breaker Reef and the Pawican Shoal shipwrecks. In 1988, broken pieces of porcelain were discovered by a fisherman while collecting lobsters at Breaker Reef in southwest Palawan. In 1991, the site was excavated by the National Museum of the Philippines in collaboration with Frank Codios Worldwide First. The archaeological assemblage totaled more than 2,000 objects such as ceramic bowls, saucers, ewers, and jars. In 1990 and 1991, remains of a sunken vessel were excavated at the Pawican Shoal, also called Investigator Shoal, in the Kalayaan Group of Islands, West Philippine Sea. The project led to the recovery of Chinese Saladon and Qingbai ceramics in the form of cups, bowls, saucers and plates, as well as stoneware jars. Along with these, Approximately 3,000 pieces of bronze rings were collected at the site, which may have been purposely hidden as the Chinese imperial government during this time prohibited the export of metals. Both shipwrecks provide tangible evidence of the vibrant commercial exchange change between China and the Philippines during the 13th century CE. The 15th century saw the emergence of Southeast Asian merchants dominating the South China Sea as China underwent internalization following the purge of the foreign Mongol-led Yuan dynasty in 1279-1368. The consequent maritime trade ban severely restricted the outflow of Chinese merchandise that was taken as an opportunity by Southeast Asians to take over the Chinese maritime routes. Southeast Asian shipwrecks dated from the late 14th century towards the end of the 15th century show the scarcity of Chinese merchandise. This is evidenced by the Pandanan shipwreck. The site was accidentally discovered in 1993 by a pearl farm diver while looking for a missing basket containing pearls near Pandanan Island, southern Palawan. Vietnamese ceramics comprised more than 70% of the ceramic cargo along with lesser quantities of Chinese and Thai ceramics. One remarkable ceramic object recovered is a declared national cultural treasure due to its age, rarity, and unique craftsmanship. The big blue and white porcelain bowl with kilin and phoenix decorations is extraordinary in that it was manufactured in the 14th century during the short reign of the Yuan dynasty period, almost 100 years before the Pandanan vessel sailed in the middle of the 15th century. The Chinese maritime trade resumed in the late 15th century, despite the ongoing maritime ban, as evidenced by the cargo of the Santa Cruz and Lanashol shipwrecks. In 1996, a late 15th to early 16th century shipwreck was accidentally discovered by fishermen at Lena Shoal in northern Palawan. The archaeological excavations were conducted by the National Museum of the Philippines along with French underwater archaeologist Frank Godio. The shipbuilding construction revealed a hybrid vessel named South China Sea Shipbuilding, a combination of Chinese shipbuilding tradition and Southeast Asian technique. 
More than 7,000 archaeological specimens were recovered comprising high-fired ceramic tradewares from China, Thailand, Vietnam, and Burma along with earthenware, elephant tusks, brass rings, and gongs. The presence of tin ingots suggests that the ship might have also touched the Malay Peninsula and Sumatra. The Santa Cruz shipwreck is another late 15th to early 16th century Southeast Asian trading ship that was discovered off the shores of Santa Cruz in northern Zambales province. The shipwreck was inadvertently discovered in 2001 by a fisherman. The site was excavated by the National Museum of the Philippines in collaboration with the Far Eastern Foundation for Nautical Archaeology. The shipwreck cargo contained more than 15,000 archaeological objects, the majority of which are high-fired and glazed porcelain and stoneware ceramics from China along with a few pieces from Thailand, Vietnam, and Burma. European naval expeditions reached Southeast Asia in the early 16th century, ushering new sea-based network links. This resulted in the birth of global maritime trade as manifested by the Manila-Acapulco Galleon trade route in the middle of the 16th century. The trade route, operational from 1565 to 1815, was instrumental in connecting the eastern and western terminus of the Pacific and, by extension, Europe and the rest of the world. The Philippines played a critical role in the emergent European colonization of Southeast Asia after the late 16th century. At present, there are eight shipwrecks dated to the 16th century including the San Isidro and the Kanduli Shoal. The San Isidro wreck was inadvertently discovered during an underwater exploration conducted by the National Museum of the Philippines and the Far Eastern Foundation for Nautical Archaeology off the waters of Barangay San Isidro in Zambales Province. The shipwreck contained a cargo of mostly Chinese porcelain blue and white ceramics, popularly known as swata wares. Majority of the ceramic wares appear in the form of dishes, saucers, bowls, jars, leads, and a box. In 1985, electronic surveys in search for the English East Indiaman Royal Captain revealed low-level magnetic anomalies on the north side of the Kanduli Shoal, also known as the Royal Captain Shoal. Subsequent undersea investigations by the National Museum of the Philippines and Worldwide First led by Frank Godio revealed shipwreck material remains dated to the 16th and 17th century CE and apparently not related to the royal captain that sank in 1773. The archaeological inventory included Chinese blue and white and monochrome porcelains, stoneware jars, earthenware and bronze gongs among others. The Chinese porcelains comprised plates, saucers, bowls, cups, boxes, bottles, and jarlets with different decorative motifs. The National Museum of the Philippines, the leading government agency tasked with the protection of the country's underwater cultural heritage, continues to analyze the objects recovered from several shipwreck sites in the waters of the Philippine archipelago to reveal more valuable information about our heritage and maritime history for the benefit of the future generations and our aspirations as a nation. We invite you to visit this exhibition and see our interesting collections when your museum opens again to the public. But for now, we hope you enjoy our Museum from Home program. Okay, so now that all of our speakers have already discussed uh, their lectures, we are now ready to accept your uh, questions. 
Also for our uh, Zoom participants, um, we encourage you to address, uh, to address your questions to our respective speakers, or you can type them in the Zoom chat box or in the comment sections of live streams and YouTube with your name, designation, and affiliation, and we will read them for you. All right, so I think we have our first question. This is from Sir Cliff Wilkie. Sir, thank you for this uh, question. Um, for those who had in text citations, uh, do you have reference list indicating the source literature which can be uh, distributed? Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, I think in all of the presentations, I have uh, quite uh, a lot of citations. Um, so to answer, uh, to answer your question, Sir Cliff, uh, yes, uh, we have some soft copies of these uh, uh, references. And uh, I think we can, you know, um, we will be able to um, distribute or, or give you some uh, of these uh, references. Um, any answer from other speakers? All right, so um, yes, we have uh, the second question. Uh, we have from Sir Louis Martinez. Um, hi. I would like to ask how do we maintain or in case of accidents, repair these uh, special instruments such as spectroscopy that we use for analyzing artifacts or objects? I think for this question, um, Ma'am Camille or Ms. Jonah or uh, Ms. Eloisa from the geology have uh, much more to answer this question. Sir, uh, for the XRD, sir, um, we have an internal agreement agreement with our supplier for annual check up uh, check up for the check up of the equipment. So it's for free, and they also offer training all the time. So if there are accidents or uh, malid or I wait up. Hello. So, so if uh, if the X ray instrument are need to repair, so we tatawagan na lang po namin yung um uh, yung supplier po namin. You for uh, for the X ray instrument. Um. Hello. I would also like to answer that question. Um. We are in close coordination with the supplier of the equipment and periodically they do maintenance on our equipment. So um, sometimes once a year or twice a year, um, an engineer of their um, company um, go here to check on the equipment. And we also do training with them for the use and the maintenance of the equipment. All right, uh, thank you for that, uh, Ms. Rachel. So any more questions from our uh, Zoom participants as well as from our YouTube viewers? All right, so I think we have our third question uh, from Maria Clarissa Gallardo. Uh, hi, is there any object that we have in our collection which is rare find? How do you analyze this kind of object without harming it? 
Thank you. Well, for this question, I think uh, Ms. Rachel has something to say about this. Um, yes, actually we have um, national cultural treasures. They are a rare find. And as I have said earlier in my presentation, we want the analysis for this kind of artifacts to be non-destructive or non-invasive. So um, we use this kind of equipment so as much as possible, we don't um, use or um, um, uh, use sampling method or we use um, non-invasive or non-destructive techniques so that um, no harm will be um, done to the artifact. Thank you, Rachel. Um, well, as much as uh, we would like to address all your questions uh, today, however, uh, due to our limited time resource, we may no longer be able to answer all your questions live and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you for your understanding. And uh, to formally close this forum, please welcome Dr. Ana Maria Theresa P. Labrador, the Dep uh, Deputy Director General for Museums of the National Museum of the Philippines. Ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, Nero. I'm so glad that we uh, managed to actually hold this third no, um, Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Forum. And uh, it's really to celebrate the, the uh, Maritime uh, uh, Month and also the Civil Service Month. and, and uh, this time, um, instead of just talking in general about our collections, it's uh, really, a, um, you know, to, to try to focus more on materials analysis. And as Rachel mentioned, that we try to do this uh, in a non-destructive or non-invasive way. And increasingly, uh, we're using equipment, much more eff uh, effective and, and also uh, sophisticated equipment to make this happen. Um, we do have a, a number of uh, thousands of um, collections and even, you know, shards and, and all these um, uh, bits and pieces that we find on site, but we don't have enough uh, information about them. And this is our opportunity to do that. And uh, the pandemic has actually created opportunities for us to look into our, our collections um, in a more detailed way. And I'm, I'm happy that our museum researchers and technicians are actually getting more into that. So thank you very much. And, um, you know, it's, it's also a happy occasion because we have finally launched our three centuries, uh, our, our upgraded three centuries of maritime trade. And uh, we're, we're so keen or looking forward to um, welcoming everyone again, but at the moment we have to keep the museum close to the pub public, you know. And so, so uh, we'll be putting the the video um, on the, the virtual launch of this uh, uh, exhibition online in our YouTube channel, so you can enjoy that much more. And we'll be um, also kind of uh, putting it uh, in some of our social media platforms. And, and watch out also for our, um, our launch of our new website. So everything is kind of nice and new and uh, upgraded. So we're looking forward to, uh, to everyone to be able to access the, the collections in that way or the exhibitions and other programs. But uh, we're really keener to get you to come and see the exhibition, especially the uh, three centuries of maritime trade. Our, our um, um, staff from the Maritime and Underwater Cultural Heritage Division really exerted a lot of effort to make sure that, you know, it's um, nicely presented, but also very informative. So thank you very much to, to them for doing that. So, so uh, I have nothing more to say, but, uh, Please keep safe. Please make sure that uh, you know you we 
um, keep healthy and then um, and then you know we we really look forward to having you here we we miss everyone um, you know it, it's it's really strange to just go around the the galleries and hallways without really seeing you know the the visitors who used to come here you know in, in kind of a very casual way so thank you so much to everyone and uh, hopefully we can have much more of this kind of um, um, forum thank you thank you so much for that wonderful message uh, mom anna um, we would like to take this opportunity as well to uh, take a group photos uh, with our uh, deputy director so I think we have uh, two pages uh, of, of participants. Uh, we encourage our uh, participants to open their uh, videos. All right. So we have two pages. Ready. Four, three, two, one, smile. Done, next page. Three, two, one, smile. Thank you so much for that. And once again, thank you so much, ma'am, ma'am Anna. Okay, so um, I think um, we have one last question. Uh, we can just go back to that question here before we end this forum. Um, Okay, so this is from Sir J. Martizano. Uh, do you have these instruments in regional museums in the country, like in Western Visayas, uh, for example? Um, well, I think... Um, I, I can try to answer that if you yeah, like. Thank you so much for that, Mom Anna. <laughs> so we, we don't have yet, no, but we're developing laboratories in the regions and... Um, we're hoping to expand, you know, these kinds of services. Like we want to set up conservation laboratories and uh, in in our uh, bigger the regional museum, so that we could actually capture the um, you know these these needs now of uh, and and to extend our technical services to uh, other institutions. So we we're you should also look forward to having more maritime and underwater um, cultural heritage exhibitions, no? So we've done that in, in Buak Marinduque, and hopefully we could uh, represent more of that in, in Palawan, for instance, in our Tabon Cave uh, area, uh, site museum, and then, you know, in, in, in Zamboanga, which will be opening uh, very soon. So, so hopefully we can, we can have exhibitions, but at the same time, technical support for, for uh, maintaining uh, collections. And then so you can kind of go around or do all these Zoom meetings with uh, our local uh, counterparts. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mom Anna. So um, I guess uh, we're done uh, with our forum. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us for today's match forum and we hope that you will join us again in the future and hopefully once this pandemic subsides and when the national museum of the philippines along with its uh, branches all over the, the country will be open to the public please visit um, the exhibition of the 300 years of maritime trade in the philippines at the second floor of the national museum of anthropology building as well as the rest of the galleries at the National Museum buildings, uh, the fine arts, natural history, as well as uh, the National Museum of Anthropology, along with the other branches all over the country. Once again, um, kindly fill out the evaluation form. The link will be posted in the chat box uh, to receive an e-certificate. And once again, thank you so much and keep safe everyone.